So, um, today we have, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Richard Somerville to you um, as the main speaker. Richard Somerville is Distinguished uh, Professor Emeritus at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego. He's a theoretical meteorologist. Uh, his research interests include geophysical fluid dynamics, thermal convection, com computational methods, predictability, atmospheric modelling, numerical weather prediction, radiative transfer, cloud physics and climate. Uh, he's also a lead author in Working Group 1 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, working Group 1 is the group that sets out the physical science basis for the assessment reports, for, in particular for the fourth assessment report, which is the one that uh, Professor Somerville was coordinating lead author of Working Group 1. I think that gives him um, at least a share, I'm not quite sure what sort of share you would want to say, of the Nobel Prize, um, since uh, the IPCC shared with Al Gore the uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize um, uh, uh, last year. And so uh, I guess that means all of the authors get some bit of it, and I don't know how you decide to divide it up. Um, he's uh, 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 Professor Somerville is also a team member of the National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center for Multiscale Modeling of Atmospheric Processes. And very importantly, he's the author of an award-winning and critically acclaimed book called The Forgiving Air, Understanding Environmental Change. Um, that's a book that was written to be accessible to the general public, covering uh, the global environmental issues, including ozone loss, anthropogenic climate change, energy, population, and policy questions. So very much along the lines of what we're talking about in this series, but, but somewhat broader in the other issues it goes to. And I'm happy to tell you, I'm not sure why we're losing the lights all here now. Um, I'd rather have the lights a bit back up if there's somebody listening to me. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, we, I'm happy to say that uh, Professor Somerville will be signing uh, copies of that book after this lecture uh, at 6 o'clock when we conclude. You are going to have to go out of those doors and straight down the corridor. We apparently couldn't get the signing table into the lobby immediately after the, door, uh, the doors. I'm not sure exactly what the problem was, but it's, it's down the corridor opposite uh, where we'll have copies and Professor Somerville will be signing. So uh, thanks very much, and without uh, more ado, welcome Professor... Oh, sorry, one more thing I do want to say. Um, uh, the respondent will be Professor uh, Liz Harmon, who is an assistant professor in the Centre for Human Values and in the Department of Philosophy. So we'll be combining the science and ethics uh, again in this session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Singer, for these kind words. Thanks to all of you for coming, and I want to say thanks also to Princeton University, to the program, to Rob Sokolow for having invited me. And my first task is to call your attention to the words in red on this slide because uh, Rob Sokolow, Professor Sokolow's talk um, next week uh, has been moved. There was a, a scheduling conflict with the original room. So if you want to go hear him, go to the room shown in red. Now, I want to uh, begin with some uh, disclaimers and uh, the like. I want also to tell you that uh, there's much more about what I'm going to be talking about on my website, um, and the URL is shown up there, and there are, are helpful links, uh, there are downloadable uh, papers, uh, there are streaming videos of talks, and there's a lot of other things relevant to this. The second thing I wanted to say is that this title is deliberately ambiguous in that I haven't said who we mean by we. What do we know and what should we do? And I really have in mind, as you'll see, two rather separate classes of people. One is humankind as a whole, confronted with the climate issue um, and faced with the need to make a decision. And the other is the science uh, community itself, the people who have, who have uh, done the research and established the climate science behind the concerns and as represented by the IPCC. I'm happy to satisfy your curiosity about the IPCC, the prize was awarded in equal shares to Al Gore and to the organization, the IPCC. So the three questions I often get are, 
get, do I get to call myself a Nobel laureate? Did I get to go to the ceremony in Oslo last December? And do I get any of the money? And the answers are no, no, no. <laughs> um, I need to tell you also that I'm uh, a little bit abashed at being here because um, of the five speakers in the series that you saw on the earlier slide, I'm the only one who's a climate scientist, and I have no credentials whatever as an ethicist. I'm in no, no sense of the word a philosopher. But what has happened um, to me, and it's a very personal story that I have to tell you tonight, um, is that over time, uh, I've found myself uh, spending more and more energy on outreach to the public and to policymakers, um, on going to the UN uh, climate change negotiations as an observer and uh, then as a, as a partial participant, and on um, working with the IPCC, which has took up um, half my life for the three years ending about a year ago when the report came out. And uh, so I've become forced, you might say, by circumstances to consider aspects of this issue that go beyond the physical science and, uh, and merge with the realm of uh, policy making and certainly, as I'll try to show you, um, of, of ethical concerns. In fact, this story is so personal that I want to begin with a story about um, my physician. I have a physician, like everyone, and I, uh, when I came to Scripps about 30 years ago, the theory that I found attractive was choose a physician your own age and grow old together, and then he'll have the same sort of ailments you have, <laughs> and, uh, which I did. And, then, and it worked fine. And uh, then last year, um, to my chagrin, he retired. <laughs> and so he recommended a colleague, and I had a new physician all of a sudden. And my wife and I made an appointment to go see the new physician, who was a very nice-looking, sort of wise, um, <clears throat> avuncular doctor type. And he said, sit down and let me tell you how I feel about the practice of medicine. This interests me very much because I've often made and I've published a lot on analogies between uh, climate science and medical science. You know, your prevention is uh, better than cure. Uh, it's the risk to take elective surgery or to take policy actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But there's also a cost and a risk if you don't. Uh, medical science, like climate science, is imperfect, incomplete, but still useful. Um, you don't, when you go see your physician at the annual physical, um, ask her to predict the date of your heart attack when she tells you you should cut back on eating and drinking and start exercising. And uh, you shouldn't make unreasonable demands on climate scientists either. There are a lot of useful metaphors, and in communicating climate science to a lay audience, they're often very, very helpful. So at any rate, I was uh, uh, there with my wife, uh, and he said he wanted to tell me what he thought about the practice of medicine, and what he said was very interesting to me. He said, there's three things you need to know about me, Dr. X. Uh, one is I'm competent. I know what I'm doing. The second is I have some integrity. I'm honest. When things come up that I don't know, I'll level with you. I'll tell you I don't know. And the third thing he says is I'm not a dictator. You know, I'll advise you. We'll take decisions together. It's ultimately your responsibility. And I think uh, that kind of... Uh, that kind of way of framing the issue is helpful because, as many people, including Jim Lovelock famously, have said, climate scientists are planetary physicians. You know, we're studying a complicated uh, phenomenon, the way this planet is changing in certain ways. And uh, I think, and the IPCC embodies these thoughts to my mind, um, that that's a very valuable role uh, for climate science. The IPCC is competent. You know, it, uh, <clears throat> its reports have been endorsed by National Academies of Science and professional societies worldwide. They're the gold standard. We use them as textbooks for graduate students. But the IPCC does. It's 20 years old. It has issued four major reports and lots of minor ones at intervals of about six years. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the reports are, are, are mandated. They're, this IPCC's charge is to assess published peer-reviewed science appearing in the technical literature. It doesn't assess rumors or hunches or conjectures. It assesses the research literature and then comes to conclusions and writes about them in a way that's intelligible to and relevant to policymakers without being prescriptive of policy. IPCC will never advocate. It doesn't do any advocating. It won't say you should <clears throat> this or that country should have uh, nuclear power or renewable energy or anything else. It just assesses the science and presents it in a policy-neutral way to policymakers and recently to the public, to the media, to the corporate world, and so on. 
That's its job. And it does this very competently. And the competence comes through the caliber of the people who work for the IPCC. I'll tell you more about them later. And uh, through the process, which is a very formalized process. The Working Group 1 report, as Professor Singer said, is an assessment of the physical science of climate change. It's 1,000 pages long. You can buy the book from Cambridge. You can download it for free from the IPCC website that I'll give you in a moment. And uh, it is, as I said, a gold standard assessment. It's, uh, it's transparent process of writing is part of the appeal. It goes through three separate drafts. They are uh, published and reviewed extensively. Um, to give you an idea of it, um, we dealt with 30,000 review comments, some helpful, some silly, uh, some uh, egoful, you forgot to cite my timeless paper. Um, and uh, we, uh, our responses to, the, to each of those 30,000 comments are published on a public website, so you can see what the authors did with each suggestion they got. Governments review it, experts review it, and so on. And uh, this process, which takes several years to put out this large book, uh, is unprecedented. It doesn't exist in any other subject where science uh, meets public policy. The IPCC is honest, and if it doesn't know, where the science is known, it says so. Where the research frontier has moved on, left settled science in its wake so that there you can agree on things. The rise in carbon dioxide is human caused, for example. There's no dispute about that among in the expert community. And uh, <clears throat> the IPCC says so. When there are, are areas of science where the final word isn't in, where research is in progress, more things need to be learned, the IPCC says that. It puts uncertainty estimates, quantitative uncertainty estimates, on its key statements, and it uses carefully calibrated language to do that. And again, the third one is the important part. The IPCC makes no attempt to influence policy. It's mandated to avoid uh, that. It, by the way, is an interesting organization. It has almost no money. It's a UN agency. It's set up with a skeleton staff. It has an office in Geneva. And what it essentially does is organizes the science community to put out these assessments. And uh, the community has participated enthusiastically and willingly in a very altruistic way. I think the, there are several reasons why this issue has come to the fore. And uh, one of them is for many people, including myself, grew up in the, the, in the first flourish of, uh, of space adventuring in the 60s. Uh, the, uh, is, is a lot has been owed to the perspective on planet Earth that comes from space. These kinds of pictures uh, made by astronauts, made by robotic spacecraft, have dramatized for many people the, the unified nature of the planet, the fact that the atmosphere is a tiny, thin shell like paint on a, on a bowling ball, and uh, <clears throat> that it's uh, beautiful and vulnerable. And I like this particular uh, image for several reasons. One, it's centered on <clears throat> uh, North Africa and Europe and France, where I live for a big chunk of every year, and rather than the US. And the other is that it shows on the right-hand side, beyond the Terminator, the dark side, um, it shows uh, the, uh, the presence of humanity in the form of um, electric usage. It's a, it's a striking image, and I think everyone who's seen uh, space images, especially children of this generation who've grown up with them, have been sensitized by them. The IPCC um, writes a 20-page summary for people who don't want to read the 1,000-page report. And for the media, for whom 20 pages is infinite, uh, it puts out a little one-sentence uh, headline statements. So if you want the whole three years of effort uh, reduced to one sentence, uh, here are two examples. The IPCC reports came out in, in uh, 1990, 95, 2001, and 2007. And they're known as, <clears throat> in IPCC has no sense of the imaginative or creative, they're known as the first, second, third, and fourth assessment reports. Known in the trade as FAR, pronounced FAR, so FAR, SAR, TAR. And for the fourth report, you can't say FAR again because it was used for the first one, so it's known as AR4. Okay, so go to a bar late at night at IPCC meeting, you'll hear people talking about, did we say this in the TAR and is it uh, the same conclusion we reached in the SAR, or will it be different in AR4? So, these statements are, in fact, made by governments. Part of the process, the IPCC is a complicated mixture of science and governments. The scientists uh, assess the research, the governments help to wordsmith it and review it, and these headline statements, like the summary for policymakers, the 20-page summary, are, are put together by governments in a big plenary. I'll show you a bit about them. So if this looks like, like negotiated language, it is, the balance of evidence suggests. But the first report in 1990 came to no conclusion at all. Uh, it simply said this is an important topic, bears watching. 
But by the time of the TAR in 2001, the IPCC um, reduced to one sentence said, there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming over the last 50 years is human caused. Um, I think for the Americans, the probably uh, another very large factor in, in making this topic uh, vivid to the, the sensitivity of the population at large was Katrina. This is a shot of Katrina. The ocean is color coded in terms of temperature. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the hurricane is a creature of the tropical ocean. It appears over the warmest parts of the ocean. It appears in the warm season of the year. The hurricanes are heat engines, very complex ones, but their fuel source is the tropical ocean. And there's a theoretical basis and a lot of ongoing research, some of it uh, here, um, that uh, <coughs> uh, deals with the issue of how hurricanes might be expected to change in a warming world. Uh, there's evidence, there's theoretical reasons why they ought to become stronger. There's a lot of ongoing research now um, to flesh that out and talk about how much stronger and, and all the rest of it. Hurricanes are rare creatures, so it takes a long time to build up uh, evidence. But the Katrina was such a dramatic event in the U.S. that I think uh, it, again, raised the, the uh, issue's uh, profile for many people. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, ethics and equity, and so that brings me to this issue of policy advocacy, which is is uh, an issue on which different people hold different views. I've told you my view right here. I think some scientists ought to speak out. IPCC cannot, scientists can. Some scientists should never be allowed near a reporter or a microphone because they just, they just can't do it. And, uh, but uh, there are plenty of precedents for effective advocacy, and one of them I've quoted here. Sherry Rowland shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995 for work that um, he and others did in the 70s. Um, they were the first to predict that there would be gradual uh, <clears throat> loss of stratospheric ozone because of the um, presence of chlorofluorocarbons. And uh, in mid-1980s, when the ozone, ozone hole had been discovered, when the Montreal Protocol restricting the CFCs hadn't yet been negotiated, uh, Roland was very actively speaking out. And as you may remember, there was a time there when the chemical industry, DuPont and other companies that profitably made CFCs, which were miracle chemicals whose, whose deleterious effect on ozone hadn't been suspected. They'd been around since the late 1920s. They were brought to made refrigeration cheap and safe. But uh, <clears throat> Roland wanted, uh, very strongly advocated a, a ban on their production. And uh, the chemical industry at that time, very much like the tobacco industry at about the same time, fought back against the science, called it into question. And uh, I think this quote is relevant today. What's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if, in the end, all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come, come true. I've been asked if Roland really said that, so I've given the reference there where, where it appeared. And I've talked to Roland about it. Um, he was, still is, at the University of California, Irvine, about an hour from me. And I've asked him whether he thinks that attitude is, is uh, appropriate for the global warming issue. And he said, absolutely, very much, adamantly, yes. So he's an example of a prominent uh, scientist at the highest level um, being a forceful policy uh, advocate. This is an interesting picture, and I want to um, show it to you for several reasons. The person in the photograph on the left, in the painting on the left, is Svante Arrhenius, who was the first scientist to have made detailed quantitative calculations of how much the Earth ought to warm uh, due to an a increment, a given increment in increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. And his answer, by skill and luck, uh, was within a factor of two of modern uh, estimates, a few degrees for Celsius for a doubling of, uh, of carbon dioxide. He published this in 1896. This is an old subject. People had done laboratory experiments in the mid-19th century, putting carbon dioxide in tubes, shining infrared light on it, measuring the absorption. So they knew what the greenhouse effect was. This is pre-satellites, pre-supercomputers, pre-climate models, uh, pre-modern spectroscopy and pre-quantum mechanics, which is the part of theoretical physics that tells you that adding CO2 contributes to the infrared opacity uh, of the atmosphere unambiguously. Uh, Arrhenius was Swedish, and so is the fellow uh, standing up there on your right. Um, that's Bert Bolin, a, uh, <clears throat> a visionary climate scientist and a, a masterful statesman of climate science who uh, predicted in the 1950s when most people were ignoring this problem and poo-pooing it, who predicted 
very accurately and quantitatively how much CO2 would rise in the 20th century. He made a 40-year forecast that was remarkably good about what the concentration of carbon dioxide would be in the atmosphere by the end of the 20th century. And uh, he devoted much of his life uh, to um, international organizations around this problem. He was uh, um, <clears throat> a dynamical meteorologist by training who switched to atmospheric chemistry. And he, more than any other single person, founded the IPCC. There was actually a group of people responsible. He was the first chair of the IPCC, and the first two of the four reports the IPCC has, has issued were under his chairmanship. And it's probably his stature. I've talked to people who worked on IPCC at that time. I did not. It was probably his stature in the late 1980s and the, and the 1990s that led so many first-class uh, climate scientists to participate in the IPCC. And a lot of the IPCC principles that we take for granted now, the, the transparency, the multiple stages of review, the policy neutrality, were enforced um, by Bolin. He died uh, last December, December 30th. But be, and so he was too ill to go to the Nobel ceremony on December 10th, but he learned about it, was thrilled uh, by it, and he was acknowledged publicly by Al Gore and others at the ceremony and before and, and after it. A true, a true visionary. In the last, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> in 2007, I'll let you read this for yourself, but the United States, as uh, Peter Singer mentioned in his talk last week, together with virtually all other uh, countries, is a signatory to a document called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed at the Earth Summit in Rio by the first President Bush and ratified by the Senate. And the, that document um, is essentially a treaty in which the nations of the world commit themselves to taking actions to prevent dangerous anthropogenic human-caused interference with the climate system. One of the rubs is that nobody then or since has defined dangerous to everyone's satisfaction. So uh, it's purely a qualitative, uh, aspirational goal, um, you might say. But the, uh, <clears throat> that framework convention has led to annual meetings ever since of uh, con called conferences of the party, COP, pronounced COP. But the US is a party to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Kyoto was where the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated was a COP. And uh, there are COPs every year. Uh, they attract about 10,000 people, uh, one-third delegates, one-third lobbyists, NGOs, one-third journalists. And uh, I've been to several COPs. We started going to them um, as a neutral NGO without an agenda, sending climate scientists to the COPs to, to answer questions from anybody, and sending graduate students along as a learning experience. And uh, I went to the last COP, which was in Bali uh, last December, and before it, a group of scientists of whom I'm one organized um, a, a scientific effort to, if you might say, inject some quantitative scientific substance into the negotiations because it's sorely lacking. When you go to these meetings, the delegates are very serious negotiations. Um, there's very little mention of the climate science. They acknowledge the importance of the IPCC. But the need for, for example, quantitatively large cuts in emissions, if you're going to have any hope of stabilizing the the uh, increase in the greenhouse effect is rarely, is rarely mentioned. So we got not, we tried not to get a large number of scientists, but we got um, a couple of hundred well-known climate scientists, many of whom, for example, by the way, were themselves authors of various IPCC reports. Many of them were heads of research uh, institutes. Uh, many of them were members of the National Academy of Sciences. One was a Nobel laureate. And uh, we signed a statement, very short statement. We didn't give them a chance to wordsmith it. We, uh, we basically asked around and put something together that everybody was comfortable with. And here it says that Bali, which was the last COP, uh, uh, ought to uh, emulate the European Union in advocating uh, limiting warming to 2 Celsius, or 3.6 Fahrenheit, above pre-industrial. And to do that, it, once you've taken that as a goal, that's not a scientific goal. That's a, that's based on your values, your tolerance for risk, and so on. But if you decide to limit uh, things to two degrees, then within certain error limits, which the IPCC reports spell out in great detail, the technical literature spells out, and they have been known for some time, by the way, they're being more refined now than previously, you have to make a major cut in the emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, sulfur hexafluoride, the CFCs, other greenhouse gases, to bring them uh, the emissions rate, the rate at which you put them into the atmosphere, down by 50% or more um, below 1990 levels. Since it's now substantially above the 1990 rate, it's much more. 
and, and so on. We advocated this. We held a press conference. We got a certain amount of uh, play, and uh, <clears throat> that was very much public advocacy. Some scientists wanted stronger statements. Some wanted weaker ones. Some couldn't sign because uh, their organizations forbade them to, although everyone signed as an individual, not on behalf of an employer or the IPCC. Um, I'm from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and uh, there's a strict rule that you must never give a talk about global warming without showing this graph. This is the most famous curve in earth science. This is the Keeling curve. Um, if we're a responsible, uh, <clears throat> one person is responsible for this, Charles David Keeling, who um, died uh, recently and who spent his whole career at Scripps. He invented the instrument, established uh, the measurements. This shows the rise in, in carbon dioxide. Um, it's extremely accurate. No one questions these data. Keeling also established the origin of the data in uh, fossil fuel consumption and other human activities. And uh, he also explained the uh, wiggles every year. That's photosynthesis and respiration. That's the interaction of the land biosphere, the world of living things, with the chemical composition of the atmosphere. But that CO2 has gone up by that much. Um, look at the numbers, 315 in these units, which is equivalent to molecules per million molecules, and uh, closing in on 390 today. This graph stops two years ago. And uh, <clears throat> you will uh, see if I tell you that the concentration in mid-19th century and for many years before that was 280-ish in these units, that means that better than one out of four molecules of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is there because of human activities. That's known with as close to certainty as anything scientific ever is. People who um, don't believe that are people who don't accept anything uh, scientific. I um, advocate the following principle, very personal statement here, although I think it would find widespread support. Um, one is, and again, the, the medical analogies are obvious and I won't belabor them, one is that uh, you can't wait around until the uncertainty is beaten down to an arbitrarily small level uh, before taking uh, action. Life consists of taking actions with imperfect information and, and climate policy is, is no different. The second is that there's widespread support for policies that have various names, win-win, insurance, no regrets, things that you would do that you would like to do anyway, uh, uh, regardless of their influence on, on the climate. And a simple example is uh, switching your car for an identical car that gets much better fuel economy, costs the same, is much fun to drive, works as well, and so on, just burns much less gasoline. The amount of CO2 put out is directly proportional to fuel economy or, and, uh, or inversely proportional to fuel economy. So if you could have a car just like yours, it not only helps the climate a little bit because it's putting out less CO2, but it also puts money in your pocket, reduces air pollution in your town, uh, improves the balance of payments, uh, reduces the cost of, of uh, getting energy from the Middle East, and so on. And the third I've already mentioned, and the ozone uh, issue is very much a paradigm here, very much an example. The decision to ban the chemicals that destroyed stratospheric ozone, that caused the ozone hole, um, was an example of uh, science, the discovery of the ozone hole, the theorizing of what caused it, public policy and industrial uh, powers all coming together on the same page and doing something that, uh, as far as we know, will result in the healing of the, the ozone hole and the stratospheric ozone layer in a number of decades. It doesn't happen immediately, but it's an example of a successful policy intervention to repair damage made by, by uh, human causes. The fourth one is also medical. Do no harm. And I'll come right back to that when we talk about geoengineering. Geoengineering, sometimes called planetary engineering, is shorthand jargon for the notion that we might interfere intentionally with the climate system. We didn't plan to change the climate when we started burning coal and oil and natural gas, but we could do things that would intentionally uh, uh, change the climate, and uh, there are people studying this, there are people advocating it, serious people, and I want to say something about that from the perspective of ethics, uh, equity, and, and fairness. I'll tell you a little bit. I've been warned not to bury you in science, but you ought to know that uh, at the same time that the CO2 has been increasing and the world has been warming, the science of climate has, has uh, developed remarkably. And some of the people responsible for that development are in this room, 
and we owe a great deal to them. And global climate models here are the computer simulations of the climate system. Uh, you can see these words here. So FAR means 1990 report, SAR 95, TAR 2001, AR4 2007. And you can see in this cartoon, which is taken from the IPCC report, a sketch of how the increasing physical comprehensiveness and complexity of the models has made them more and more ambitious attempts to mimic the evolution of the system. So, for example, early uh, models, classical models, classical in physics means wrong, um, classical models uh, here had a simple hydrologic cycle and prescribed CO2. The most recent models uh, have seen much more complicated physics, including the whole of the climate system, not just the atmosphere, but the land surface, the ocean, the world of ice and snow, biogeochemical bio uh, cycles. They're vastly more ambitious. And this has happened over essentially one working uh, lifetime. As I said, some of the pioneers uh, in this are still very much active. At the same time, we've benefited from uh, Moore's law, from the, the extraordinary increase in computer power and the decrease in computing costs. And here's an example shown for the four reports, so again, over a 20-year period. Um, this is an example of the size of the horizontal grid into which the world is tessellated for computational purposes. You can see that uh, the top uh, sketch, uh, when grid sizes were about 500 kilometers in the horizontal, the Alps um, was about uh, two grid points. I can't see from where I am, but the Alps is around there. Um, <clears throat> whereas uh, there's much more detail in, uh, in uh, later models, so there's much more computational realism, much more ability to simulate the finest, uh, the finest scales. So there's been a huge uh, increase in the power of these computer um, models. I think that among the many ethical concerns that have come out, again, speaking as a climate scientist who's basically been thrust into this arena rather than anyone with any expertise uh, and, uh, in, <coughs> in this subject from a, from a foundational philosophical point of view, it's very clear the UN Framework Con Convention recognizes the differentiated rights and responsibilities, which means essentially that uh, the developed world and the developing world, uh, to pick two obvious examples, have different responsibilities, have different abilities to do things, different kinds of, of uh, technology. And this was very much present in Bali. You don't hear everything in Bali that goes on while you're there, because it takes a badge to get in. There's 10,000 people. And uh, a scientist with a kind of observer badge is not in the room uh, when uh, serious um, intergovernmental negotiations are going on. You hear a lot, though. Um, it's, a very, it's a beehive of activity. There's lots of uh, antennas crossing and lots of information passing. And in simplest terms, for example, one heard um, the, uh, the developing countries, say large developing countries like China, which, by the way, recently passed the U.S. as the largest uh, net emitter of carbon dioxide by countries, China saying to the United States, it's you in the developed West who have found prosperity through exploiting cheap, readily available uh, coal and oil and natural gas. You've caused the problem. Who are you to tell us, the developing world, that it's our responsibility to deny uh, our populations uh, what you regard as basic necessities? And China has made it very clear that uh, it finds that economic development trumps um, uh, environmental concerns in this case. China is opening a dirty coal-fired power plant, one or more, roughly every week. Um, that's why it has passed the U.S. as the net emitter. There are many other and more subtle concerns here, small island nations, for example, who see uh, the need to evacuate entire populations as sea level rises, which is a necessary uh, response to a warming planet, have said the same kind of thing. The intergenerational equity is a very difficult issue. This problem, so far as we know, has a long fuse. And I'll show you an example of that later on. We're talking here about the planet that your children and grandchildren will inherit. A policy action taken now doesn't have a strong effect for quite some time. There's a huge inertia in the system, huge by, say, political timescales. So that a politician who advocates a cap and trade system or a carbon tax today will find that the climatic consequences of it come long after the next election. And I want to talk about geoengineering. I'm frankly skeptical of geoengineering on many grounds. I'm skeptical of its, uh, of its uh, technical, logistical feasibility. I'm uh, extremely skeptical of the ability to do it in a way that both has an effect on climate and does not have unanticipated side effects. Think of all the unanticipated side effects that have caused uh, this problem. Nobody 
uh, building a factory in, powered by coal in the 19th century worried about the environmental uh, global consequences of this. Uh, nobody, Midgley, the person who invented chlorofluorocarbons around 1930, was hailed as, a, <clears throat> as a, uh, an Edison-like figure bringing a, a, a technological development to the benefit of mankind. He also, by the way, invented tetraethyl lead, which used to be in gasoline, raises the octane, but has uh, bad environmental effects. And history is full of examples of um, the technolo technological developments that turned out to be Faustian bargains, that turned out to have an unanticipated cost, that uh, brought initial benefits and later were recognized to cause serious side effects. And I deeply am deeply concerned about the hubris of people who uh, blithely, to my mind, advocate um, some geoengineering solutions. A typical geoengineering solution, for example, is to do something to make the Earth brighter, uh, paint the surface white, uh, put uh, mirrors in space, uh, put uh, sulfate aerosol particles, small particles, or their chemical precursors in the atmosphere to uh, cause more sunlight to be reflected away and less to reach the, the Earth. We'll come to them. This is the geekiest figure I'll show you from the IPCC report. Um, in the top panels for the six inhabited continents, the black line is the, the temperature, average temperature increase uh, since um, the early 20th century. You see in all the places the uh, warming in, the, in recent decades, the last three or four decades, is marked. That's true in the lower three panels, too, which are the whole world on the left, land in the middle, ocean on the right. The world is warming everywhere. The ocean is warming as well as the land. It's not an urban heat island effect. And the blue and the pink are attempts by computer simulations to replicate the development of climate over roughly the 20th century under two sets of assumptions. The blue, the computers have been in instructed, so to speak, to take into account uh, estimates of changes in the sun, volcanic activity, natural causes that affect climate. And the pink, in addition, uh, involves telling the computers to take into account uh, the increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and the increase in, in particle pollution. And as you can see, only the pink uh, uh, computer simulations are capable of, uh, of mimicking the observed black line rise in, in temperature. That's part of many streaks of evidence that lead to an IPCC conclusion that uh, it's human causes that are behind this. This is the plenary in Paris, the IPCC plenary, where the governments, who are the people with uh, ties in the back of the room, wordsmith the document that I showed you. I'll show you what they came with. We, the coordinating lead authors, the heads of the chapters, were present there. It's a closed meeting, no press. We're the people up front uh, with ties that we borrowed from somebody. Um, and uh, we're there to make sure that while the governments are changing the language around, they don't do violence to the science. We never lost control of the scientific content. They could say that sea level rise was real, serious, a matter of concern. They couldn't say it was trivial or non-existent or unimportant. Here's one of the headline statements in a dramatic break with tradition. We had two this year instead of one, as in previous years. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal, and I won't read it to you. There are many chains of evidence that lead to this. The climate is warming. There's no doubt about that. And the second statement, uh, these were the released to the press on the date uh, shown there at the end of this week-long plenary of wordsmithing, um, that most, more than half, of the observed uh, warming in the last 50 years or so is very likely, that means 9 out of 10 chances of being true or better, uh, due to uh, human-caused greenhouse gas um, increases. This is signed on unanimously. The, the uh, operative rule at IPCC plenaries is that if a single country digs in its heels and says we can't accept uh, that statement, then it doesn't go in there. Very few um, statements suffered that fate. There's a, there's a very close similarity between the final approved word-by-word -word unanimously uh, confirmed document and the draft that we wrote um, going in. As, as I said, there's some wordsmithing. And, and personally, I found this time around, it's the only time I've been uh, part of the process, uh, was, I found that the process was constructive and harmonious. There was uh, no uh, partisan wrangling. Uh, there was uh, no attempt to be obstructionist. Uh, old timers say there had been in the past. Some people say there were again in the other parts of the IPCC that deal with mitigation and adaptation to climate change. But I think there was a kind of unanimous uh, process uh, here, and uh, you didn't see countries um, uh, trying to, trying to uh, foot drag here. Very heartening, in fact. There's the website again for the IPCC reports. 
I wanted to show you this figure here to, to bring home the, the nature of the increase. This is the long time scale perspective. Look, in all of these figures, on the left is 10,000 years ago, and on the right is today. And look at the top figure. That's carbon dioxide. And do you see that over nearly all of the 10,000 years, there was a near equilibrium with long-term slow variations around 270, 280 parts per million in the same units as Keeling's curve. Keeling's curve is the red uh, line at the top of the, of the uh, spike here. There. And the, the inset show, is a blow-up of the uh, period since the late uh, 18th century. And so you see this remarkable increase. As I said, there's no doubt we know from isotopic signatures of the carbon that this is fossil fuel carbon and land use change, deforestation carbon. It's not volcanic or some other natural carbon. So you see this tremendously uh, dramatic increase. You might wonder how we know, incidentally, in case anybody's curious, what the composition of the atmosphere was chemically 10,000 years ago. And the answer is we have the marvelous stroke of luck that we have ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica that can be dug up, dated, and that contain tiny bubbles of air trapped as the snow <coughs> under pressure froze into ice. So we have fossil air samples. And the technology is so slick that they can be analyzed. And those measurements uh, jibe directly with the modern measurements due to Keeling. I've taken out of the IPCC report uh, a few scientific highlights, just my choice. I won't um, read it uh, to you. The rate of CO2 increase is going up. The Keeling curve is steepening. You'd like to have it flattened out, um, and turned down. You'd like to see the concentration reduced. Uh, but it's uh, growing faster than ever before. The Earth's uh, uh, about a degree and a half Fahrenheit warmer. As I said, the hurricane issue is an area of active research, but the IPCC concluded that there was a significant uh, <clears throat> increase, statistically meaningful increase, in the North Atlantic, which is the best sampled um, basin. The Arctic is the canary in the coal mine here. The Arctic, because of feedback processes, warms faster than lower latitudes. An interesting factoid, um, if you look for the 12 warmest years since instrumental records were good enough to, to matter, uh, 11 of them are in the last 12 years. And most of the heat, 80% in round numbers or more, is uh, that's been gained by the system during this warming is in the ocean, which is warming in all the ocean basins and is, is warming to great depth. So we're interested in the future. This is a future-oriented activity. And so an interesting question is, this, this picture is a dramatic proxy for energy use. You see where the rich developed countries are. And you can imagine uh, in the developing world, I mean, India and China each have more people than Europe and the United States combined, you can imagine other parts of this map that are fairly dark now brightening in the future as energy use um, increases. And the interesting task in Roland's uh, way of phrasing it is, uh, can we make predictions of what the, uh, the climate will be? Is the science good enough? IPCC doesn't make forecasts. It doesn't do research. It assesses research, but it influences the research. And it makes these kinds of predictions, that sea level will rise eight inches to two feet. And there's a chance it could rise more. But one of the things we don't know, one of the uncertainties, is this, uh, <coughs> this uh, possibility that ice sheets on Greenland and parts of Antarctica could, could destabilize. But it's a possibility. It bears watching. You can't put numbers on it yet. But over the next 20 years, um, IPCC, regardless of whether we emit lots of emissions or, of, or few, expects a continuation of present uh, trends. And here's a way to dramatize, and this is also a figure from the re report. On the, in the center column here, you can see uh, the warming. The darker the color, the greater the warming. And here's the, uh, a, pos a possible scenario, not a prediction, but a possible scenario, in which we emit relatively few greenhouse gases. And here, relatively more, and here in the middle. And these figures don't differ from very much. This is in the decade of the 2020s. But by the 2090s, when uh, some of our children and grandchildren will certainly be here, and maybe some of you, um, there's a big difference between the lower emissions and the higher emissions uh, serial, uh, scenarios. And you see that over here in probabilistic terms. And an interesting thing is the, the, on the left is the, the bell-shaped curves for the 2020s. On the right, for the 2090s. But now they're no longer bell-shaped. And for many of the models, the different curves are different climate models. There's a long tail to the right. There's some non-zero likelihood that the warming uh, might be greater. So this is uh, IPCC's way of summarizing in a, an easily intelligible way for policymakers. 
It's interesting, by the way, and it's an aside, but I think an interesting one. IPCC, although it doesn't do research, influences the research. And you will find scientists in this field um, saying, what I've got to do is get ready for the next IPCC report. They'll expect me to run these scenarios. They're going to publish the report in 2013, AR5. So I have it, have it published by 2012. So I have to have the results by 2011. So by 2010 and 29, I have to be running this stuff. Sugar, I had better hire people and uh, get computer cycles on the supercomputer super now. It's driving the research agenda. And I think that's good and bad. And I, I'm afraid that a lot of this kind of research has become rather pedestrian crank turning. That you, you get the best model you can, you freeze its structure, and then you run these assigned scenarios. And many climate modeling groups all over the world are charged with doing this. And you can find people at the federal agencies in Washington who fund research saying our job is to support the IPCC. So although the IPCC's job is to assess research, the fact that it has become so prominent, so well regarded, um, so important in many ways, you find it has unwittingly and inadvertently torqued the research agenda. And I think one could make a case, and you hear scientists talk about this, that if there were no IPCC, the same people in the same computer cycles might be doing uh, creativity and uh, uh, you know, I might say research that was, uh, that was just driven by, uh, by in simple objective inquiry, people getting right ideas and wanting to test them out. Um, or they might be developing their models or diagnosing their models or doing other things. And I think from an equity perspective, the, the, what the world will demand soon, increasingly strongly from the science community, I've said this in the center and bottom paragraphs here, is results that don't simply speak in broad scale uh, to what the, the planet as a whole uh, might experience in terms of warming, but will ask, for example, what happens to water supply in the arid American Southwest, or what happens uh, to sea level in, in uh, low-lying areas of the world, what happens to storm tracks and precipitation, many other aspects of this very rich interlocked tapestry that is, that is climate that really affect people, affect ecosystems, uh, affect uh, the planet as a whole. We're going beyond the picture, and I think uh, global warming is a catchy uh, journalistic phrase, but it doesn't describe much of what's wanted. Um, I said I'd say a word about how IPCC uh, was run. Here are uh, some interesting numbers. IPCC chooses people basically on the grounds of scientific expertise and disciplinary spread, but makes a big effort to achieve many kinds of, uh, of uh, diversity, and you can see some here. There were. 25% were young, in the sense that they were less than 10 years out of grad school when they were appointed. 75% were IPCC virgins. I'm one. Didn't have anything to do with the previous report, so I had no, no need to defend it. 35% were from the countries that, in general, don't have the supercomputers and satellites, but still have very valuable uh, perspectives. And it, for me, it was an extraordinary experience working with this uh, array of, of people. I learned a great deal. I'm going to skip this uh, uh, slide over. It shows temperature rising, by the way. If anybody tells you that 1998 was the year that global warming stopped, that just happens to, the spikes here are El Ninos and the, the troughs are, are La Ninas and just happens to have been an El Nino there. It's still warming if you can uh, think of a smooth, uh, smooth graph. I wanted to say uh, again a word about geoengineering before I'm done. The, I con am concerned um, with geoengineering, as I said, on several grounds. And one of which is I, I find it um, hubris bordering on real arrogance for people to say I or my company or my country has the right to take action on behalf of all humanity. You haven't polled all of, all of humanity. And I'm very much worried. I'm all in favor of research, including small uh, scale field trials of interesting mechanisms. What happens if you put this kind of chemical um, into the ocean? Fertilizing the sea with iron, by the way, is is a geoengineering tactic designed to spur the growth of plankton that take up, uh, and small other microorganisms that take up uh, carbon dioxide. I think uh, there are many consequences you could worry about in an imperfect world. Uh, does the, the, the prospect of geoengineering uh, tend to make people uh, more cavalier about continuing to add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, as though you were an alcoholic and there were a pill that could save your liver and so on, so you could keep drinking and stay healthy? Um, and I, if it worked perfectly, it becomes addictive. And there are, are as I said, technical and, and logistical challenges. But it seems to me very unlikely that, uh, that a geoengineering approach 
um, will be trouble free and quite probable that it will be extremely troublesome. For example, one of the things that's going on now is a lot of the carbon dioxide ends up in the ocean, which from a chemical soup point of view is dilute carbonic acid becoming less dilute. And it's harder for shell forming small uh, organisms to form shells, calcium carbonate shells in an acidic um, environment. And we don't know very much about the effect of that on the base of the marine food chain. Uh, I'm skeptical about geoengineering. Study it, do research, think about it, make models, try lab tests, do small scale experiments. But uh, it ought to be a last, if it's a last resort and a bad scenario, let's avoid that worst case scenario. I'm going to close by telling you a word about uh, Charles David Keeling, Dave to his, his friends, an extraordinary um, person who died uh, three years ago. Keeling invented the instrument. There was no accurate way to measure CO2 before he figured out how as a grad student and a postdoc, especially as a postdoc. Um, he was a driven person. His dedication to accuracy is uh, legendary. His numbers are absolutely trustworthy. He was an impossible person to have as a grad student advisor, the Scripps students have all told me, because um, he'd just as likely to say after you'd finished your PhD thesis, well, that's good, that's an interesting result. Let's start again, build a different instrument, put it in a different location, see if you get the same results. We'll know in six years. And uh, so he was, he was a hard man, and, uh, and he was driven. Um, Roger Revelle, the director of Scripps and a pioneer in this field, said that Keeling was born with a gene for measuring carbon dioxide. And, uh, I'm showing you on the bottom left uh, the first uh, uh, dozen years or so of his measurements. There were many, uh, many fits and starts. The record is virtually continuous, but funding agencies, one after another, decided they didn't want to do carbon dioxide or they didn't want to do routine pedestrian measurements, and uh, he had to fight for them. On the right is his observatory. It's actually a Weather Bureau observatory uh, formed during the, inter inter <coughs> the International Geophysical Year in the late 50s. He put his instrument there because he argued correctly that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere so long, well over a century on average, that uh, that's plenty of time for the winds to mix it around. So measuring CO2 uh, in one pristine location would give you a number that's representative of, of uh, <clears throat> the global average. And he was right about that, too. He established the, um, as I said, the uh, human origin, and he established the cause of the interannual wiggles. And an enormous amount of research has been empowered by his measurements. And the Keeling curve is a kind of iconic figure. So much so that today, um, this picture is the Great Hall of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. And you can see a lot of iconic figures of modern uh, science. Uh, here's the double helix. Here's Mendel's peas. There's Darwin's finches. And here's the, the Keeling curve. So, um, he's uh, finally recognized widely as the great scientist that he, that he was. We're going to do a short experiment now. Um, I'm going to summarize here that I think ethics and equity and fairness and justice are critically important and not simply on abstract or theoretical grounds or points of principle. They're practical too. When you go to Bali, when you listen to representatives of governments, um, when you take account of what motivates people, it's not just uh, good scientific data. They want to know, countries want to know that they're being treated fairly and equitably. It, <clears throat> the ozone uh, treaties empowered developing countries by paying them, uh, by giving them a delayed timetable to conform, by making technology transfer available. China would happily not uh, burn coal. If you've been to a Chinese city recently, you know how impossible it is to breathe. They are suffering huge present-day public health consequences and other uh, adverse consequences of the need to have rapid energy. But they're doing it, from their point of view, the only way they can. If there were a better way, uh, they would. And so considerations of, of international and intergenerational and interregional um, equity and ethics are necessary, in my view, for practical solutions. I see this as a scientist participating in these, in these negotiations. And I think um, that for a solution that says at the bottom to be effective and just, then not only does good climate science have to inform the process, but so do real world considerations of uh, ethics, equity, fairness. This is a post-hypnotic suggestion. You will find yourselves motivated when you come out of your trance to walk out the back doors there and down the hall past the uh, art gallery to in front of room 106 where this um, marvelous, easily intelligible, scientifically up-to-date, accurate, remarkably economical book is available for sale. It's holiday season's coming up. It makes a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful gift. I've waived all royalties. It's published by a little nonprofit organization, the American Meteorological Society. They get 
they get all the money. So I just want to see people enjoy my book. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Peter, who modulates this? this oh, it's Liz's oh, turn. It's, it's Liz's turn. Good. Well, we should try to figure out how to you wanted shut to, that down. No. Oh, I can shut I'm this down. I'm just going to talk. I can shut this down with no trouble at all. Can everyone hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So um, thanks so much for that talk. That was um, very, very interesting. And um, in a way, I feel like I don't have much to say, but I will, I will find some things to say now. Um, first, I wanted to talk about um, the what Richard started off um, with, which was this idea that the way that a doctor should deal with his patient is the way that climate scientists should deal with the with um, the planet. And um, one thing that doctors should do is offer advice and step back. Um, and um, the idea that scientists shouldn't just say, shouldn't be policy makers. It's OK for scientists to be act to, to, to play some political role, but that there's some um, presumption against scientists being policy makers. Um, I guess I want to say, I think that the issues are really different with doctors and patients than with climate scientists. So with doctors and patients, one issue is um, Autonomy, so you don't want to infringe a patient's rights to decide what happens to their body. If a person doesn't want to get medical treatment, even if it's uncontroversial that the medical treatment is a good idea, we typically think the person has a right to refuse the treatment. I'm not sure there's quite a parallel to that kind of consideration in the climate science case. Um, I think that Scientists are sometimes reluctant to offer policy prescriptions because they don't want to offer them, they don't want to claim their authority as scientists to say, well, this is what we should do. Because saying that this is what we should do partly involves making a kind of a value judgment about what our aims are, what our goals are, what's most important to us. And as scientists, they're not experts on what our aims are, what our goals are, what's valuable to us. But... Um, Sci but climate scientists, like doctors, are often in situations where it's easy to see what our, what our aims and goals are and what's valuable to us, because certain outcomes are really, really bad, and it's kind of uncontroversial that they're really, really bad. And I think that climate scientists are often in that situation. So some of the, some of the predictions that climate scientists are in a position to make are that things will be really, really bad, and everybody's going to agree that those outcomes would be really, really bad. Um, so I have a bit of, um, I'm, I'm not as inclined to think it's important that scientists be hesitant to, to be policymakers. I think we need, we need more, more engagement in our policymaking from scientists. Um, that just seems good to me. Um, I, what I found myself thinking about at, um, in this question of like, what do we want from scientists in our policymaking, I think that one thing that we, we really do need from scientists is to really distill the science into a vivid bottom line that we can care about. And there was one point in Richard's paper where this really came out for me which is when he was talking about um, how it might be good to have less of an emphasis on global warming and these kind of general scientific facts about the Earth as a whole, and more of an em and maybe scientists should be doing more to tell us about the specific concrete consequences, and maybe that would be helpful to policy. I, I have to say, I think that's really right that that would be helpful, and that that is what we need from 
from scientists because um, that's the because in a way what we face with with climate change, in a way I think it's not that interesting as an ethical puzzle. It seems like the what we're heading for with with global warming is really really bad. We uh, we should prevent it. The ethics in a way seems easy, but we definitely face a practical problem of how do we get ourselves together to, to prevent um, what, what we're heading for, and how do we convince other people that we should prevent um, continued global warming and that we should try to correct the global warming that's occurred. And in the US, we really do, it's a, it's a vivid, practical problem. Our government hasn't adopted the right policies. How do we convince other people to adopt the right policies? Um, and one thing that scientists can help with is really saying concretely, here are bad things that are likely to happen. Um, and what makes things vivid to people is not claims like the temperature, the global temperature is going to rise by two degrees. What makes things vivid to people is claims like lots of people died due to Hurricane Katrina and things like that will happen a lot more as the temperature rises. And so Katrina did serve this useful function of making global warming um, more of an issue that more people are willing to care about. Um, so as I said, I don't see climate change in a way as presenting an interesting ethical puzzle because it just seems to me climate change is this really bad thing. We should, pre we should prevent it. And I know that Last week, Peter Singer talked about various arguments that have been made that the U.S. isn't responsible to make um, big policy changes, that the U.S. Doesn't, isn't obligated to make big policy changes. And um, I think Peter quite effectively undermined some of those arguments, and I won't rehearse that. Um, when I try to play devil's advocate and ask the question, well, why wouldn't we be obligated to prevent um, the changes, the, the continued climate changes that we're headed for. Um, I think, well, maybe people think, consider the deaths that are gonna recur, that are gonna occur as a result of climate change. Maybe people think it's not that we're, that our actions are causing those deaths. It's not that we're killing the future people. It's more like we're just letting them die. We're just failing to intervene to let them die. Um, and we're just letting them die. But that, that in a way seems wrong. It seems that if our daily activities are responsible for CO2 emissions and, the, and this is, and our current activities are leading to the continued climate change, then we are playing an active causal role in future deaths. I think that we're more like, we're, we are related to future deaths more in the killing way than in the letting die way. So, I don't understand that, that reason for not wanting to engage and affect climate change. And then again, when I play, even if we thought that, well, the question is, should we try to prevent these bad things from happening to other people, um, but we wouldn't be responsible for those bad things, still, it seems like what we face is relatively small sacrifices that we could make that would prevent really bad things for future people. Um, and in general, if you, can, if you can do that, there's a lot, often you should make small sacrifices to prevent things from being really bad for other people. Um, so those are the things that I wanted to say. To recap, I think Scientists should be policymakers. I think we should we should um, try to affect um, climate change, try to prevent continued climate change. And in a way, I think um, it's not an interesting ethical puzzle. It's more of a practical puzzle of how do we get other people to see that that's true. Thanks. would come up. Um, we have uh, 20 minutes or so anyway, maybe a little more, for questions and discussions. So uh, anyone like to open that? I see a hand over here. Yes. Uh, it's a little hard for me to make a distinction between uh, proactive actions like throwing iron in the ocean and uh, retroactive actions like shutting down coal plants. Uh, they both seem to be deliberate actions. Uh, I don't see how one is uh, better than the 
Well, I can tell you from a practical uh, perspective, if not from an, from an ethical one, that shutting down a coal plant uh, is a step uh, toward reducing human interference with the natural climate system. Uh, if humans went out of business tomorrow, then the planet over a long period of time would return to the, the pre-industrial chemical composition. Natural cycles would take over, you might say. And whereas intentionally putting iron in the ocean um, is an effort um, to uh, make a change in the climate system that will in some measure counter the inadvertent change that, that, we've, uh, that we've caused. It's the difference uh, between, you might say, of deciding to stop drinking if you're an alcoholic and seeking for a pill that will, or a treatment that will make you okay despite um, your heavy drinking. Can I, can I follow that up just a no. little? Because I, it was a question I was interested in too. Um, is there an assumption that natural is better? Um, because there's many areas in which people make that assumption in, in uh, bioethics where I think they're really wrong. Um, I mean, we, we obviously don't think that uh, medicine is a bad thing because uh, it's an unnatural interference in uh, what would happen to us otherwise. Uh, but people do very often appeal to, to nature and say something that is unnatural. Uh, uh, if we had Lee Silver here, one of the people who do bioethics in this university, um, he, for example, would reject arguments that uh, genetic modification of crops is wrong because it's unnatural. He would say, well, depends whether it's dangerous or not. You have to show that it's dangerous. It's not enough to show that it's uh, unnatural to have genes from different species being used. So I wonder if you'd get a comment on that. I think the, the comment I'd make to that is that natural isn't necessarily better. I could imagine a more pleasant world than the one we inherited, you say. My, my imaginations might not agree with someone else's, and we've adapted successfully. We and the, the, other, uh, the rest of the planet have adapted to the... Uh, to the natural world, you might say. One of the things that characterizes the climate changes that, are, that are, we are beginning to see evidences of is that they are extremely rapid compared to natural changes, so that uh, there is loss of habitat for many species of animals, for example, and uh, the, uh, the rapid change in, in sea level uh, overwhelms low-lying areas, increases vulnerability to storms, and so on. One could cope with this over a longer period of time but we're talking about a, a rate of change that exceeds the natural rates by, by a great deal. When the economists and the like make calculations of winners and losers, because there are some winners. Uh, if Canada and Siberia are a little warmer, perhaps the growing season is longer, for example. Uh, but when you make uh, calculations like that, there are many more uh, losers than winners. And the losers, as is often the case with natural disasters, are especially among the poorest, least able to cope. And American agriculture can, can uh, take advantage of uh, genetically modified crops, of irrigation, per fertilizers, pesticides. A subsistence farmer in Chad doesn't have those options. And so, uh, so it falls, the, the burden falls very unequally on people, but, but losers outnumber winners by every serious calculation. Thank you. Okay, yes. It's a long story, and I'm writing a book about the views of the contrarians or skeptics. There are lots of names for these people. They exist in all fields of science, of course, and some of them are highly credentialed and many are not. Historians of science who have studied this issue seriously have uh, concluded that it's very rare in science to find the degree of consensus or unanimity, whatever you want to call it, among the expert community. The great bulk of those who, who disagree are... Um, uninformed people, and I think are very often motivated not by an interest in the science, but by concern about the policy. If your value system, your economic convictions, and so on lead you to distrust government interference with free markets or to uh, be opposed to, uh, to taxes or the ceding U.S. sovereignty to international agreements, that sort of thing, 
your tactic might be to cast doubt on the science, much as the tobacco industry's tactic was to cast doubt on the science when their goal was to sell cigarettes. And uh, I, I think uh, that uh, a great deal of uninformed skepticism, skepticism is good, all scientists are skeptical of received wisdom, but a great deal of uninformed contrarianism is uh, on display today. There's a well-organized, well-funded disinformation campaign. And uh, whereas, in fact, the expert community is in remarkable accord about a lot of this. Once again, as I said, there are areas where there's, there's research to be done. But on the basics, um, there's, been, uh, there's been accord for, for a very long time. And for example, the, ver the notion that this is caused by the sun, we have a lot of quantitative evidence of that. We measure the luminosity of the sun. It rises and falls by about a tenth of a percent over the 11 year solar cycle. That translated into its effect on climate is a factor of 15 lower than the increase in carbon dioxide. So it just doesn't carry weight um, quantitatively. We know the causes of ice ages, for example. They're due to, to changes in the Earth's orbit, but they operate on very long time scales, tens of thousands of years. They won't affect, they don't change enough to make any difference on a time scale of decades. So there are good scientific responses to many of the, the contentions of that that community. They're not well enough uh, propagated, you might say. While I have the floor, I think the IPCC has a terrific job at science assessment, but it has, it's not capable of doing the, all of the communication that needs to be done. I regard the IPCC report as, as a source of information. It's unmined ore that has to be machined and refined into movies, textbooks, uh, all kinds of ways to disperse the information more widely, counter the disinformation campaign. Well, it's, so, getting better information, yeah. presentation technology, uh, people who are experts in mm -hmm. how information can be conveyed, yeah. so the impact of a lot of small changes could have a more, uh, could be more easily yeah. understood by the larger population. Well, the, the Nobel Committee agrees with you that Gore did a lot to, uh, to spread the word, you might say, to communicate the science. And uh, I uh, personally hope uh, for the day when uh, uh, Lucas and Spielberg and Francis Ford Coppola make uh, global warming uh, movies. It's a, it's a talent scientists uh, don't, don't have. Um, there's, there, a great deal remains to be done. In this country, uniquely, because Gore is a polarizing political figure, there is a partisan divide that's toxic. And it's getting worse. Polling data show that uh, conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats hold completely different views about uh, climate change, and that's increasing um, with time. That's not true in the rest of the world. And a lot of centrist and center-right leaders in Europe, for example, like Merkel in Germany or Sarkozy in France, um, are very strongly of, um, of the opinion that, that climate ought to be something that ought to be, be done about. I agree with everything Liz Harmon said, and one thing she said reminded me of the conservative commentator William Buckley's uh, contention about whether experts should make policy. He said, He'd rather be governed by the first 500 names in the Boston phone book than by the Harvard faculty. And I, um, I realize I'm talking about Harvard and Princeton, but uh, I think on, in areas of, uh, like this where, ex where, where science matters to policy, then I do think wise policy can be informed by sound science you know, without making the Harvard faculty the final arbiters. Richard, I Yes. And so in that sense, I think that... Oh, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm just... Uh, the speaker was Barry Ann Moore, who directs 
uh, <clears throat> Climate Central here and as a distinguished uh, climate scientist in himself. And I think, uh, I agree with you, I think the IPCC has done far more good than harm. It's been a, tr a tremendous success. I'm an admirer of the IPCC. When I look at the way resources are stretched and the way the, the research community is being asked to do many things, including take time away from research to write IPCC reports, then uh, I, I sometimes wonder how to prioritize. If we had twice as many people so that we could have two scientists for everyone now, one of them running these scenarios, for the example, the other looking at other things, then uh, I think it would be better. But one of the very exciting developments as the science has progressed is that we're now poised to be able to answer these questions about the kinds of factors that Liz Harmon identified, the regional and phenomenological uh, factors. If I live in Southern California, as I do, I'm going to be much less concerned about a two degree or three degree global warming than I am about how Southern California is stressed by uh, reduced Sierra snowpack and decreased river flow so that we have to start rationing water and, and all the rest of that, which has many consequences from increased wildfires to, to bug infestations. And uh, so uh, I think those are the issues that matter to people, to ecosystems, in the end to politicians. Um, and with science is getting to the point now where we can answer them. I'd rather see more effort on them than on what, to my mind, is mind-numbingly pedestrian useful, but uh, not exciting intellectual activity of, of simply running prescribed scenarios. But ideally, we could do both. I have two comments. One is to add to your list of Dave Keeling's contributions. Yeah. Uh, he's also trained a lot of the people who are carrying on, including his son, Ralph. Th that's... That's, you're, you're, you're quite right, and had I another 45 minutes, I could uh, praise Dave Keeling f for it. Uh, it's a remarkable father-son combination. Since you brought it up, let me tell you, everybody, not everybody knows this, the story. As carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere, what's happening is that uh, in your car engine, for example, the carbon in the gasoline is mixing with the oxygen in the air. That's why the CO2 goes out the tailpipe. And so when you think about it, you're not only adding to carbon dioxide, you're re decreasing the amount of free oxygen in the atmosphere because oxygen molecules that were drawn into your fuel injection system are no longer, <laughs> they're now bound up with carbon when they go out the tailpipe. So the amount of oxygen is actually going down, but it's an incredibly tiny amount. Carbon dioxide is a rare gas. Oxygen is one out of five molecules in the atmosphere. And so you'd think it would be impossible to measure the oxygen going down, but Ralph Keeling, Dave Keeling's son, my my colleague on the faculty at Scripps, is the person who figured out how to do that. And he has measured the amount of oxygen being decreased as his father is measuring the CO2 going up. He's done many other things, but that boggles my mind. Sounds like you're right that there is a gene for measuring gases anyway. <laughs> they're, they're, both, they're both very good at it. And Dave Keeling, legendarily good. But you had a second point? Yeah. Uh, in terms of geoengineering, you, yeah. you can think of three realms, the atmosphere, the ocean, yeah. and the land. Mm -hmm. and, um, in, in the ocean, we haven't geoengineered at all up to this point. In mm -hmm. the atmosphere, we've, we've done it inadvertently to mm -hmm. some extent by mm -hmm. changing ozone, for example. And on land, we've done a lot by uh, mm -hmm. you know, cutting down forests for, for agriculture, yeah. right. uh, land use activities generally. And uh, it, it seems like uh, it's, it's not clear that geoengineering schemes that I've heard about on land are going to be useful. Right. But on land, um, geoengineering might be a little more defensible mm -hmm. if, you know, if there were useful schemes because we've done so much yeah. that we'd have a better chance of understanding uh, what the consequences would be. Yeah, that, that may well be. I'm a technological optimist on this issue, and I think uh, one of the reasons for the lack of, of progress has been the one Liz Harmon identified, which is that in this country, for example, the federal government, which opposed uh, Kyoto, which was a, a tiny baby step, and that you can't lay that entirely to the present administration. It was opposed by the, it wasn't pushed by the Clinton administration. It was opposed by the Senate nearly unanimously. Um, didn't propose a substitute for it. And so we haven't had at the national level in the United States what we've had in states, municipalities, some corporations, which is a decision that this is important, we're going to do something about it. California has passed a law with criminal penalties for failure to reduce emissions enough. We'll see if it works. But uh, once it becomes a national and international priority, then I have huge faith in the, what's possible when creative corporations and engineers start getting busy on, uh, on things to do. So I'm all in favor of it. I mean, there are people studying drawing 
uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which is not easy thermodynamically. There are people studying sequestering uh, carbon uh, before it gets into the air, take it out of the stream when, when you're burning fossil fuels. There's all kinds of things that can be worked on, but it requires political courage and popular will to make them happen. Uh, yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier how uh, there's, a, there's an imbalance between like, developed countries and other developed countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. earlier on in the century and now developing countries are playing catch-up. Can you talk about quickly about how the, the consequences of climate change may affect differently developed and underdeveloped countries, the uh, yeah. southern hemisphere versus the northern hemisphere? Maybe that, how that might enlighten our possibility. It's a, it's a wonderful question and a huge uh, topic. The, the atmosphere homogenizes the carbon dioxide. So outside special zones of pollution like this room, if the, the CO2 over Princeton is not what, uh, what Mercer County put in, it's what the whole world put in. So the concentration is the same no matter where it was, was put in. And I agree with, uh, with uh, Professor Harmon that it doesn't require a great deal of, of uh, ethical uh, hair pulling to decide that it's a good thing to avoid harmful change to the environment. But I think it's necessary to pay special attention, meaningful attention to concerns of equity and fairness when you're asking countries with different perspectives to join together. That hasn't happened yet. We don't have a binding international re regime that has teeth and that's strong enough to do what has to be done to reduce emissions enough that all the countries will sign on to. And I think that's really part of the story. China, uh, the growth in emissions is occurring in the developing world. With few exceptions like the US, the developed world is stable or declining in population, and it's not increasing in, in energy use per capita, therefore emissions per capita. And there are special cases like France, which decided for non-climatic reasons to develop nuclear power, and over 30 years went from zero to its present number around 80% nuclear electricity. I know and you know nuclear is not trouble-free, but it doesn't emit carbon dioxide. So different countries have very different perspectives, and I think that it's this, these concerns of fairness that uh, are what is required to produce the international agreement that, that we're, all, we're all seeking. Because the U.S. now, is the, its emissions share is below 20% and shrinking as India and China and other big developing countries ramp up. So that the U.S. could do everything possible. You could, have, you could drive an electric hybrid uh, powered uh, by, uh, by nuclear electricity. E U.S. emissions could get far lower than I think is likely and you still have a global problem because you haven't dealt with the rest of the world. Um, so that's, I think, the tough issue right now, is to, to find ways to, to get broad participation in a meaningful way. I'm very concerned that there's a major misunderstanding in the room and that you need to fix Okay. <laughs> No, it's not, and, and uh, Rob Sokolow has put his finger on, a, on something important, and I think uh, underlines the importance of getting quantitative. I don't know whether two degrees is even achievable or not. There are plenty of reasons to think that in practice you can't keep it as that low. It will be a huge, very rapid uh, reduction in emissions. It would be an extremely expensive change in the energy system of the world. Um, it's not trivial. It's not just recycling a tin can. It's uh, basically trading in the present fossil fuel-based energy system for something quite different in a short time globally. I don't know if it's achievable. Um, I think, by the way, that my friends who do a lot of international negotiations on environmental issues of all kinds say that the details of the initial agreement are less important than keeping it on the table and getting people serious about it. The Montreal Protocol was later strengthened by many amendments that have made a difference to the ozone issue, but the fact that you had a strong statement initially that you could revise later is, is important. But what we're talking about, your, your goal is to flatten out the Keeling curve, to make the carbon dioxide level 
and ultimately those of other greenhouse gases. CO2 is the most important, but by no means the only one, to make that concentration stop rising. And uh, that is a huge cut in emissions. Uh, it's much more than 50% in the long run. And it has to happen soon. It has to, has to start soon because emissions are rising rapidly now. So it's a big, big change. That's why this is, is difficult. It undermines any idea that ethics is easy. So to self-advertise and after my talk next week, you still think ethics is easy. Something's wrong. Okay, I didn't I don't I think I said a lot of provocative things. I didn't say it was easy. Oh, I'm so happy when the Princeton faculty's quarrel is with one another. <laughs> okay. uh, you want to defend yourself, Liz? I wondered if she wanted to comment because it is so far from this problem properly understood. That's why we're having this series. It is not easy. The job of mitigating climate change is ferociously difficult and raises one ethical problem of it after another. And by the time the series is done, I hope we get this. I'll just say a couple things. If I can add, add my comment, I think there, it, is, it is a lot of change, but I guess in terms of weighing the balance, then it's, it seems pretty clear that the costs will be greater if we don't, if we don't do it. Right? So, some place in the middle. Right, so exactly where, if you like, where you draw that line, where the, the optimum level of, of sacrifice or change is to produce the best outcome um, does get more complicated. So we agree with that. Uh, I know there were more hands, but it is uh, a little bit after six, and uh, I think we should bring this to a close. I remind you of the uh, book signing that uh, uh, Professor Somerville will do out there, and no doubt you can have a chance to uh, ask further questions there. And I remind you also that uh, you'll hear more from uh, Professor Socolo uh, next week um, in uh, year 10, so uh, the series is continuing. but. Uh, now, a pleasant task to thank Professor Summerville for a
Thanks a lot. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Some good exchanges, and uh, no doubt that will continue over dinner.